Hello and welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield. This is a podcast about the deep values that drive us, the people behind the positions in our public conversations, and how we can build empathy across the very many, many things that we disagree on. Every episode, I speak to someone who has some kind of public voice or platform, from activists to artists, journalists to philosophers, entrepreneurs to academics to comic book writers to archbishops and many more. And I'm trying to listen deeply to people from a wide range of positions to understand how they got to where they are, both in their professional life and in their thinking, and learn from their wisdom about how we can better cross our divides. If you listen long enough, you should hear someone that you wouldn't naturally choose to listen to, who you might even vehemently disagree with or dislike. And it's helpful to notice that those two things often come together. But I hope you will, by listening, increase your understanding and maybe even learn something interesting. I have done this long enough now to know that everyone is more complicated, usually more conflicted, and often more a person of goodwill than I perhaps perceived them to be before we met. It's really helped complicate my narratives about the different tribes in public life, and I really hope that it does for you too. In this new series, you may already have noticed that we are adding some reflections at the end so I can chew over and reflect on my thoughts after the interview. So do keep listening if you would like to. And as usual, If you have a moment, wherever you are now, on the bus, walking down the street, on the toilet, maybe head over to iTunes and leave us a little rating or a review. I'd be really, really grateful for that. And remember, one of the most helpful things you can do is send an episode to a friend and start a conversation with them. We really, really love encouraging new, interesting, deeper conversations. And in this episode, you'll hear a conversation, one I had with David Brooks. David is an op-ed columnist for the New York Times, a radio and television host, author of multiple best-selling books, and chair of Weave, the social fabric project at the Aspen Institute, among many, many things. You can go and read his very impressive biography for yourselves. We spoke about the distancing effects of fame, his midlife crisis and subsequent conversion to Christianity, the challenges of talking about morality and public life, and the immense difficulty of dying to ourselves. I really hope you enjoy listening. I've actually, I've been thinking this morning, David, that I was going to kick off by flipping the order of what we usually do. Usually right at the end, I ask people about how we navigate across our differences, our tribes, how we build empathy um, in places where there is division. And I'm going to flip it and ask it at the beginning, partly because I know you're writing about how, how we learn to really see each other, to really encounter each other as human beings, partly because I am... After the Bible, Martin Buber's I Thou is my kind of secondary sacred text. And also, honestly, because I've been having this real wrestle this morning between David Brooks, famous New York Times columnist, the sort of cultural artifact, the cipher of your identity in public, and then David Brooks, fragile, complex human being like everyone else, who I want to be able to connect with in this conversation. <laughs> and the, I find it often when I interview particularly famous people or powerful people or there's various ways we create distance right so I just wanted to name that right at the start to try and get out of the way and ask are there ways from what you're reading and also from your experiences that would help this conversation be more I thou that I can honor you and treat you as a human being and not just someone who I'm trying to extract something from <laughs> uh, yeah I mean the thing that comes to mind is uh I don't think this has to do with writing for the New York Times and being moderately well known uh I think early in life, you um, you put up walls and barriers in order to be efficient uh, and in order to achieve success. And so I would say I value, I came to value time over people. And that was sort of a natural defense for somebody who's naturally aloof. My nursery school teacher told me I was an aloof personality. Uh, and Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, said, my friends say I have an intimacy problem, but they don't really know me. Uh, and so that that's uh, that's something I share. Uh, and I would say in midlife, uh, I hopefully have gotten more emotionally open. And I, I've had a, a couple occasions where somebody didn't know me or somebody knew me a little and saw me, say, within a four year interval. And on a couple of occasions, five years after they previously had a conversation with me, they said, I've never seen anybody change so much in midlife. You were so blocked before. 
Yeah. Uh, and when I look at videos of my earlier self, I think, wow, I'm really not that guy anymore, uh, which is a good thing, though. I, I suffer a lot more. I was much happier when I was super shallow. Uh, I didn't have any bad emotions. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> sad in the morning. So I was kind of good. I'm, I'm so pleased to be shallow. Uh, now I'm burdened with the world's problems. <laughs> Even Oprah said that to you, which I thought was hilarious. She's like, oh, David Brooks yeah. got interesting again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if Oprah, does, if Oprah knows, then she, that must be the truth because she's Oprah. She is. Um, okay. I am going to ask you about the word sacred. Tell me both how you feel about it as someone who cares about words and if you have an intuition about what might be sacred to you. Yeah, I mean, I, the first thing that leaps to mind is the word um, soul. And I happen to be a person of faith, but I don't think you have to be a person of faith to believe in a soul. Uh, that you can believe that each person has some piece of themselves that has no size, weight, color, or shape, but has infinite value and dignity. And the reason slavery is wrong is it's an attempt to insult a soul. Rape is an attempt to insult a soul. And we're not equal in the realm of our ideas or our muscle power, but we're equal on the level of our soul. And so my view is if you treat everybody who has a longing soul, a soul that longs to be good, you probably treat them the right way. And so that's the first thing that leaps to mind is sacred. The second and maybe more peculiar thing is time is transition over the centuries. So when I feel the sacred, I feel it in Sharp Cathedral. I feel it on the streets of Ephesus. Uh, I feel at any time there have been a progression of people over centuries who have regarded a place as important. And even in the US, if you go to the Gettysburg battlefield, or if you go to Waterloo in Belgium, uh, and you find places where people were violently alive, uh, and you hear the ghosts, the ghosts of their dead and then the beaches of Normandy, for some reason that procession of human interaction over centuries in a sacred place is when I feel um, that kind of spiritual depth uh, most acutely. Do you think what you hold sacred has changed or have those two things been fairly constant? Yeah, I used to hold uh, Arsenal sacred. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I think, I definitely think it has changed. I would say what was sacred to me as a kid was probably not that much. So I did, I went to my, I grew up in a New York immigrant household. And like New York immigrants, there was a culture in those days of acute Anglophilia. And so the phrase was, uh, think Yiddish, act British. Uh, and, <laughs> I've and, never heard that. Yeah, and so all the Jewish families gave their kids English names, so nobody would think they were Jewish, and they were names like Irving, Norman, Milton, Sydney. It didn't work at all because, as soon in America at least, those were considered a Jewish names, not English names. Uh, but I was sent to an Episcopal school called Grace Church School in Lower Manhattan, and I looked up at the ceiling of this beautiful, beautiful little school. It looks it's a Gothic chapel. Uh, and I certainly had a calling of the sacred. And I'm not sure it was the stained glass, the images of Jesus, the 12 stations of the cross. It was more the soaring arches that uh, enlivened something in me, even as a, a four-year-old, a fourth grade choir boy. So you had a sort of syncretistic feels too strong. It's usually used negatively. I don't mean it like that, but certainly a kind of woven inheritance of Christianity and Judaism in your childhood. What if anything, I'm going to use the G-bomb, God, was God a presence to you, an absence, a theory at that stage in your life? An absence. Uh, and, and as a Jew, I experienced um, Judaism as peoplehood, as the Exodus story, as the procession of the centuries, as one's responsibility to a people who just 16 years before I was born were nearly exterminated from Europe. And so the acute sense of peoplehood and the Hebrew phrase the door of a door from generation to generation, I acutely experienced that then and acutely experience it now. And Christianity was uh, really polite, tall, good looking people. <laughs> no, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but it was it was like as an immigrant, these Episcopalians were um, were essentially Anglican, but they were the establishment. Uh, and they had they came from a different culture. They didn't shout as much as we did, uh, but they uh, but the story and the songs and the hymns were just woven into the fabric of my childhood. Uh, but I certainly did not experience any presence of God. I had no encounter with God. I had no sense of the transcendent. Uh, it was these were just important moral systems built around a series of books that were useful to read for wisdom. 
We'll come back to this later, but you've wrote, written a lot about the transition from a kind of moral realism to a moral romanticism and, and various other dualities. When you think about your childhood, is it a mix of those stories or would you pull out one or the other that you think was most dominant? Yeah, I mean, uh, frankly, when I think about my childhood, I think about my grandfather and the immigrant story that he raised me with that you know, the, which is an Exodus story. It's we came from oppression, we crossed the ocean and came to the promised land. Where did he and, come from? Uh, Ukraine, Ukraine and Latvia, essentially. So we were all on the pale of settlements, the Jewish settlements in Central Europe. Uh, and so, but it was that sense you were arriving, you know, and, and the Exodus story played just this powerful influence on American history that the Puritans thought they were leading, living the Exodus uh, the founders, the American founders, wanted to put Moses on the great seal of the United States because we had come to the promised land. Martin Luther King talked about Exodus more than the New Testament. Uh, and so that was just the story into which our lives were shaped. And and the Exodus is a story that happened in order to be told. <laughs> God told Moses to lead people across the desert so we can have a story to tell about ourselves. And the community is a group of people organized around a common story. And so that was certainly the defining feature of how not only I saw a, a, the moral life of the centuries, but my own personal life as this journey toward the land of milk and honey. And what were your teenage years like? Schmucky. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I was... Uh, uh, a smug, self-satisfied, completely happy teenager. And so I did not go through an angsty period at, by the time I knew I wanted to write, but I was in a pretty nice group of friends, uh, probably about 30 of us, and we all dated each other in different order. And if anybody has seen the American film, The Breakfast Club, that was my school. Uh, it was a big public high school with all the cliques and the jocks hated the drama kids and the greasers hated the, you know, I don't know who, the tech kids. Everything I know about American society, I learned in the cafeteria in high school, which is that people will divide themselves off into social identity groups, and there will be natural rivalries between these groups. You went to the University of Chicago, and you've talked really um, movingly about the kind of intellectual legacy there. Um, you were studying Western civilizations, or that was your kind of summary of what was being taught there. Is that right? We were all studying Western civilization. So the, the University of Chicago had a great books program, a core. So for the first two years, I read... I think I calculated, I wrote 17 papers on Thucydides. I probably took three or four classes on Thomas Hobbes. Uh, we were thrown into the great books and it changed my life. Once you've tasted the fine wine of those books, it's hard to go back to Kool-Aid. And so I think it left an imprint. First, uh, intense love of learning. And, it, and our professors, you know, I, uh, there's a saying that if you catch fire with enthusiasm, people will come for miles to watch you burn. And our professors thought that if we read these books carefully, we would learn how to live, learn how to good, live a good life. And so there was the moral improvement of oneself was on the agenda. And the tool was not the Bible. It was not charity. It was not Doctors Without Borders. The tool was Nietzsche, Hobbes, Kant, Augustine, um, George Eliot. Uh, and so this was the, the path to the good life. And, and once you raise that sort of moral aspiration, that life is about what the Germans call Bildung, moral formation, then uh, you've planted a seed of disquiet in your students that they will spend the rest of their life trying to, um, trying to fulfill. My impression is that's maybe ebbed a bit from educational institutions, certainly in the UK. And the U.S. is what's seen as the purpose of education. Do you feel that? Very much so. The, there was a sense that education was about uh, what they call the humanistic ideal, the formation of humans. Uh, and uh, there's a, a school, a prep school, you call it public school in the um, New England, where the headmaster said, we try to create students who are acceptable at a dance, invaluable at a shipwreck. And so that sense that this is some work, we're forming a person who will come through in a crisis. That for all the snobbery of Eton and rugby and those schools, that was what they thought they were about. And that was certainly what the University of Chicago thought it was about in a different way. The universities have shifted. And I have a friend and cousin, uh, the very famous uh, linguist, uh, Steven Pinker, who says, um, you know, I've been involved in a zillion faculty hiring decisions 
And I went to grad school and I never got a class in moral formation or character building. And forming character has never been part of our hiring decisions when we hire for our department. And so we know nothing about this. So we should not really be in that business. And I understand his point, but I would say, especially when you're dealing with young people and maybe with all people, you're in the business regardless. <laughs> and and the students are hungering for not for you to tell them how to be good. They, they're not going to listen that way. But they want to have a moral vocabulary so they can figure it out. And so whenever you offer a course that tries to deal with moral formation, they flock to it, even if it's a shallow course on positive psychology or something like that. Uh, the hunger is out there. I will... Um ignore the wince I can hear from all the positive <laughs> psychology listeners. So you left the University of Chicago with this sounds incredibly precious um, sense of the power of literature and words and civilization for the good life. And then we're writing opinion pieces and editing and working your way up in journalism and writing books that were more kind of social analysis, Bobo's in Paradise, The Social Animal, which is where I first came across you. What were the kind of threads you were pulling on during that season of your life, I guess, personally and professionally? I think I was writing more about status then. Uh, I was more in the Tom Wolfe world, the world of Pierre Bourdieu would be the highbrow version of this. Uh, and uh, the world of uh, Paul Fussell, a guy who wrote class. Uh, so I was, I was writing sociological analysis and it started because I was a humor columnist. Uh, and when you write books that are humor, you can't, it's all you can do is make fun of rich people. And I was perfectly happy to do that. So I made fun of rich people as for a living. Uh, and so the, these are the sort of people who live in upscale suburbs of America. And so my first book, Bobos in Paradise, was really gentle mockery of people who uh, had made a ton of money and then had invented a code of consumption in order to prove how, how spiritual they were. So they wouldn't spend money on the, the fancy chandelier and lobster, but they would spend $20,000 on an Aga stove to prove that you were sort of a peasant uh, involved in good cooking or sleep shower stalls. The rule was you could spend any amount of money on a room formerly used by the servants. So it was this code of sumptuary consumption that was spiritually enlightened. So I, Bobos in Paradise was really making fun of them. And little did I know that this class of bourgeois bohemians would become the dominant elite class in society against which every other class would rebel. And little did I appreciate that the the people who used to be, what do you call them, Sloan Park Rangers or people like that, they would grow up to be slightly more cultured. And then the whole Tory party would swing against them <laughs> and and nominate, you know, Boris Johnson to stick a thumb in the eye of the uh, the Hampstead elite or something like that. Whilst looking suspiciously similar himself in many ways. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's a. How were you conceiving of yourself during that time? There's this sort of inter sign ridiculous conversations about elites. But did you have a? Did you have the very human status anxiety yourself? Did you wonder how you were positioning yourself? How was your sense of identity during that period? Yeah, especially in that kind of time in my life, I made a living off of self hatred. So I, I <laughs> proudly said, I'm a member of this. I do this. I, I went to a, an elite school. I live in New York City or Washington, D.C. I ride the Acela, which is our train line from New York to New Haven to Boston to Washington. Uh, and um, so that, that I confessed to being a member of the class, and I guess I still am. Uh, and, but I, I wrote a piece called Status Income Disequilibrium, which is about people who have high status and low income. And That's so, journalism so familiar. Per, Every journalist I talk example. to has yeah. that. <laughs> and so, like, we talk to rich people interviewing them for our jobs, and then they go home to these really nice apartments. We go to these crappy little places where we have to clean our own toilets. And I, I talked about the, the moral trauma of this life. Um, which is a helpful pivot to uh, 2013. I don't mean to laugh because I know it was actually a very dark time, so forgive the crunch of gears. Um, you have written really vulnerably and openly about that crisis. Can you tell us a bit about what happened? It was a crisis of values. I mean, on the surface and in some real way, it was, it was just the normal personal crisis that people go through occasionally. It was uh, going through a divorce. Kids had left home. Um, and so I was stuck in this crappy little apartment and I did what any American idiot would do when overcome with a moral and emotional problem. I tried to work my way through it. And so I became a complete workaholic. And the, in my book, The Second Mountain, I described um, the metaphor for that phase of life, which was um, 
I was never entertaining anybody because I didn't have that kind of friends. And so I, if you went to the drawer in my kitchen where there should have been silverware, there were post-it notes and where there should have been plates, there was stationery. And that's the metaphor for a kind of workaholic life. Uh, the, the larger problem was a sense of um, leading a life according to values that I knew were wrong and coming to not recognize oneself. And, and that's um, leading a life of uh, emotional numbness, uh, lack of vulnerability, uh, lack of spiritual hunger. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I uh, had written this book, The Social Animal, about emotion. It was classic me. I, I wanted to find out what emotions were, so I wrote a book about it, <laughs> uh, rather than maybe I should feel some. <laughs> and and so that was that began the process of hopefully some sort of personal change. And what I said earlier about that Oprah thing, it's a lesson which I firmly believe that people, it's never too late to pretty radically change your life. And what's really telling, and it's beginning in the road to character where it's clear that you're kind of hunger for these stories of people who have depth and moral courage. And there's beginning to be bits of you in there, but it's only really in the second mountain where you write really vulnerably and openly about you just the phrase, the howling loneliness of your, or howling emptiness of the weekend and the, and the loneliness. And I, I had this real sensation of, oh, thank goodness. Because in all our conversations about vulnerability in public and the importance of not just kind of uh, staying distance and, and analytical about these deep things, it's usually women who do that. It's, uh, it feels like there's a harder set of hurdles for a male, you know, slightly older, conservative leaning generation that doesn't come at all easily. How, how hard was the temptation to resist of just going, I'm going to keep writing about this analytically at a distance and not put myself in it? Yeah, it was, um, it was hard at times, partly because I have a political profile. And so all your political opponents take your vulnerability as an opportunity to pounce on you, which they indeed did. And so I knew that was going to happen. Uh, but I, I figured I couldn't really write about this stuff from a position of distance. Uh, and I had to take some chances on myself. And I think the rule of vulnerability is you should be slightly more vulnerable. You should regret it slightly afterwards. You should be a more real and then say, oh, I was probably a little too open there. And if you're not doing that, you're probably not going far enough. <laughs> and, and I would say that though, that in most books, most nonfiction books in the U.S., probably in the U.K., are read by 60, 40 women to men. There are more female readers than male readers. But this book, when I toured the Second Mountain a couple of years ago, you, you know, you sign books and there's this line of people to sign. And I would look down the line and it'd be eight guys and then a woman, nine guys and then a woman. And so there, uh, my line was basically like a, a bunch of 50-year-old white guys. And I realized I could have a second career as a, a CEO whisperer because there were so many successful business executives who said, hey, can we have a phone relationship? I've got nobody to talk to. Yeah. And so it was a lesson in private male misery, yeah. uh, and, which I think is, is not being processed the way when if you look around a restaurant, when you two women get together, they're staring into each other's eyes and they're talking about real stuff. Uh, men, it's, it's much more let's look at the opposite sides of the wall uh, and talk about football. Yeah. And, you know, you see that cashing out in suicide rates and all kinds of other other things. Um, I do want to ask you about Christianity. I want to ask you about what uh, the sort of shorthand for seems to be a conversion, but I want to do it with a few caveats, which is, this is the most private of things. <laughs> and I'm also aware of the way that when people move tribes in public, there is an unlovely instinct for the receiving tribe to kind of want to stick a flag in them, you know, as fast as possible to like bag their scalp and say, one of us, in a way that totally flattens the complexity and the fact that we might shift around in all kinds of things and that finding faith at any point in life is a delicate, easily squashed process. What were the beats in the song that led you to go, okay, I'm uh, am I right in thinking you're probably just about ready to call yourself a Christian now? Yeah, I, I, I used to say I'm religiously bisexual because when I found faith, I, I uh, felt more Jewish than ever. 
and but also more Christian than ever. And my Jewish friend said, yeah, that's not really allowed. <laughs> if, you, if you accept Jesus, then you're not on the team anymore. Yeah. And so that's a fair point. Uh, I, I think what happened was I found it all happened in the wrong order. Uh, it happened in an order that didn't make sense. I experienced grace before I experienced God. And so I, I experienced some sort of love, uh, uh, unconditional love before I figured there was a guy up in the sky or, and then what, then I experienced a sense of being observed. Um, and then gradually I experienced a sense of that there is a moral order to the universe. And so there's a theologian, Paul Tillich, uh, who has a phrase, the ground of being, that the ground of being is a loving order, a moral order, uh, an eternal order. And so I was up, you know, occasionally in nature, I just had this sense of things clicking into place. Uh, and I didn't have words for it. And it wasn't like Jesus walked through the wall and said, hey, come follow me. It was like, that never happened. It was the most boring process imaginable uh, of gradually life seemed to become more enchanted and more alive. Uh, the spiritual realm seemed to be alive with a transcendent and divine presence. And I liken it to, I think in, the second mountain to you're riding in a train, you're sitting around with all the familiar people, you're drinking a cup of coffee and you look out the window and you realize you've covered, there's a lot of ground behind you. And at some point you crossed over a border and you're no longer a non-believer. You're a believer in something. And then what you do with that is at least in my case, you read <laughs> and you try to read people who are articulating what you're going through. And I found that as you are searching, uh, people send you books. Uh, and so I was sent about 600 books in the course of three months. And my joke is that only 350, which were Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Uh, and But it was in that process of reading, I came to refine, what is this that I'm feeling? What is this enchanted sensation? What is this sense of, of divine love? And, and really more a sense of a moral order. Uh, and uh, because I had grown up with the Christian story and because I'd grown up with the Jewish story, they both came alive to me. And I read the Bible, Old and New Testament, in new living and more true ways. Uh, but I, I found myself in, in the States when, in my community, sort of highly educated coastal, when you come to faith, you come to faith through Oxford. <laughs> and so it's C.S. Lewis, it's J.R. Tolkien, it's Sheldon Van Auken who wrote A Severe Mercy. And so you have a very classy kind of God <laughs> and a sort of appropriately Britishly restrained kind of Jesus. <laughs> and I think I sometimes wrestle against that. Like uh, Jesus was a Jewish guy from the Middle East. <laughs> and when you actually see him through the Jewish lens, living in Jerusalem in a land of vicious conflict, a series of highly organized power structures, which he upsets all at once, you realize Jewish, Jesus is a total badass. He, he's not like a guy in a tweed jacket. Uh, and so I, uh, I came to defend the, the much more aggressive um, Jesus that shocks. Uh, and I came to believe in that. And I will say that the one thing you, when people want to put you on their team, that was certainly true for me. And I would come to, when I was exploring going to churches, I'd get there early like normal. And so many people would want to meet me. And then Pat, during the passing of the peace, they'd come over to shake my hand. So I began to go to church late after the service had started and leave early before it had ended in order to not go through the social rigmarole. And that made me lonely. That made me really lonely. And so that was destructive. Yeah, it's that thing about the way fame distances us from seeing people as a real person right? They become a symbol or a cipher of something else that we can use for our ends. I know a few friends who also find it difficult to go to church because of that. I have been reading your book this week and also um, Status Anxiety by Alan de Botton, who is a philosopher, very good writer. Um, and you both quote the death of Ivan Illich by Tolstoy, which was obviously written at a quite similar turning point in Tolstoy's life, where the sense of the moral universe that I've been living in, that if I have enough status and money and progress and success, that kind of first mountain life, then I will find satisfaction. And both Ivan Illich and Tolstoy have a crisis of realizing the hollowness of that and the, the lie 
that that is where satisfaction is found. Um, and you and Tolstoy somehow managed to cross the precipice into an alternative moral universe where there is grace and connection and relationship. For whatever reason, my husband jokes I have this weird like spiritual gift of being a friend to overeducated middle-aged men. <laughs> and some of them have been on the podcast. Uh, I have lots of dear, dear friends who have moved a long way from a very materialist atheism to a conviction that religious faith and spirituality is good for societies, to a conviction that it's good for individuals and have got stuck because, and there's a couple of the conversations on the podcast that you can listen to people going, why can't I accept this for myself? I don't know, I just can't. There's something about the leap. What is your, do you see that? in people around you? And what is your analysis of what holds back that particular tribe? Because I see such a lot of it. Yeah, I'd like to rewind the tape to the sentence that included the phrase you and Tolstoy. I like that sentence. That's good. (laughs) Nice comparisons. Uh, I I would say it's apt to say Tolstoy, because one of the things that Tolstoy had was he was one of the greatest writers of all time and knew it. And so he was renouncing something that he was was at the top of the game. And I would say for me, when I get stuck, as maybe I am stuck, um, it's because I still haven't disabused myself of the Tolstoy myth. That if only I can write a really good book, then the spiritual fulfillment were there. So it's the it's really hard to renounce all the values you had as you were climbing up the meritocracy. And it's not only selfish. You think if I wrote a good book, it would be a contribution to... Our, all our conversations. So you think you're doing good. And, but it's about the self-perfection, the self-improvement, the, the mastery of a craft and the mastery of a communication skill and the ability to renounce that and die to self. Well, that's a really hard thing to do in our culture or in any culture. And I certainly have not succeeded. I wrote this book, The Second Mountain, about renouncing some of the worldly definitions of success then I'm freaking checking my Amazon rating every hour. So like, I wouldn't say I cured myself of this. <laughs> and, 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 but I think Tolstoy does part the way. And when you meet somebody, some of the characters in Dostoevsky in particular, uh, who have renounced self, and you see a beauty there um, that, is, um, that is beyond what, what you can achieve when you stay in our frame. Yeah. I... I want to talk about the challenge and the difficulty of talking about these biggest, most important things in public. I was reading a review of The Second Mountain and it made me laugh out loud, but it was a, he was commenting on particular passage that you were talking about these transcendent moments of connection with other people and the world. And he wrote in the margin, is this book about bonking Brooks? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and really seemed unable to m- deal with the lack of concreteness of talking about virtue and ecstatic encounter and intimacy and relationship and was clearly trying, bless him, but just it was like bouncing off. He was he was he he thought it was a good book. He was he wasn't sure what it was saying. It just. Is it about sex? Like that's that's the only category I have for intimacy and relationship. As your writing has moved from this more kind of very good but distant social analysis to this more urgent, personal, who do we want to be? How do we want to live? What have you learned about how you help that stuff land well? Yeah, I, I was struck by that. And that has happened several times when people, you, you talk about Martin Buber and I thou and I, I was trying at various points in the book without Buber's eloquence or mysticism to get into that sense of an interpenetration of souls of what deep communication is really about. And more than one person just said, oh, that's sex. Uh, and, and I think that's because I guess for a lot of people, they were not raised with the category of, of intimacy. Uh, and so that's the best they can do. And it's kind of smart ass to say, oh, he's just talking about bonking. I, I'm, a, I'm a secular writer. I write for secular, the New York Times, secular publications. And so I try to do it in a way that 
talk about faith in a way that won't turn people off. Uh, and, you know, one thing to do is I've ragged on C.S. Lewis, who I don't mean to because I admire him greatly, but, he, you know, he would never use a big word when a small word would do. Uh, and he wrote for radio often. And so that's just very useful as a communications tool. Everything was low key. It's not he was not operatic. Uh, the good Lord came down to me in, in a burst of sunshine and raiment. Uh, he was. Yeah, this is just what happened. And, but I would say there are certain categories that one has to be careful about explaining. Some even bother me. And so, for example, I was talking about before the second man came out, I was talking about it on a TV show. And I said, well, I mentioned the word sin. And an editor in another house wrote to me an email and said, I love the way you talked about your book, but I wouldn't use the word sin. I would use the word insensitive. It's like, well, I'm not sure insensitive is really sin. But I asked a friend of mine, how do you talk about sin in public, a pastor? And he said, well, I talk about disordered loves, that we all have certain loves, and we all know some loves are higher than others. This is an Augustinian concept. Uh, and if I, you tell me a secret and I blab it at a dinner party, I'm putting my love of popularity above my love of friendship. And that's disordered love. That's a sin. And if you talk about it as disordered love, you don't have to talk about it as depravity in the human soul, which really does repel a lot of people. And you don't have to talk about sin as masturbation, like which is what a lot of Christians talk about it as. And so it's something people can relate to. But translating the categories into acceptable forms uh, is, I think, part of just communications. Have you come across the Francis Spufford uh, phrase for sin? He has a book yeah. called Unapologetic, which I think you'd really like. It was one of our earliest interviews, actually. And he rebranded sin, and I'm going to swear here, so apologies for listeners, but it loses its power without it as the human propensity to fuck things up. And then he <laughs> contracts that into or however you would spell it and uses that all the way through his very, very good book about the emotional power of Christianity. He's a very um, garlanded fiction and nonfiction writer in the States, uh, in the UK. Um, but he says very early on, I need to talk about sin, but I, when I say the word sin, you think of lingerie and ice cream. And I want you to think of the ways that we hurt each other and the ways that we break things. And it is such a powerful um, usage that um, you yeah, might enjoy. Yeah, yeah. the more highbrow usage is the, an ultimate allegiance to a finite end. Yeah. That you're, you're just serving something. And, you know, I'm, I'm writing a column today about there was a case in Philadelphia on a commuter train line where a woman gets on at, at 9.14. A guy starts molesting her. He molests her for about 40 minutes. Then at 40 minutes later, starts raping her. And there are other people on the train in the car and no one intervenes. No one calls the police. They just whip out their cameras to get a video of it. Uh, and so it's a case of somehow sin is there. It's the sin of the rapist, but the sin of the bystanders. Uh, and so, the, it, you know, Chesterton said the concept of original sin is the one empirically verifiable aspect of this. And, and so that case is such a morally horrific case that... Um, you wonder what was going on in their minds, but then you wonder what kind of society is it in which people are enculturated in such a way that that happens. I was really struck actually reading your last two books, how often you, you're very comfortable with the word morality. And my backstory with this is that I worked for a while on a BBC program called The Moral Maze, which is a um, ethical discussion program. And the M word was Inc was always tripping us up because we'd ring people and say, we want you to come on and make this oral, moral argument, which is a position that we know you hold because you've said it somewhere. And they said, well, I wouldn't call it a moral argument. And we'd say, why not? And they said, well, it's an evidence-based argument or it's a philosophical argument. And I'd say, well, why, don't, why don't you like the word mor moral and morality? They say, well, it sounds, it sounds judgmental. It sounds like we are judging people. Talk to me about that. How do you avoid sounding preachy? And why do you think we are so sensitized to the possibility that someone talking about their vision of the good is inherently a judgment on us? Yeah. Well, I don't totally walk away from the judgment like the rapist on the train. I'm judging him. <laughs> uh, the, the passengers, I'm judging them. Uh, am I confident that I would do otherwise if I were a passenger? Can't be totally confident on that. We all think we would be the one to leap in. 
But um, in real life circumstances, people who say they will leap in do not leap in. And so I, I you know, the people are asked, what's the essential um, virtue? Augustine was asked this, and he said, well, the essential virtue is humility, humility, humility. And I think if you um, try to aspire to a sense of humility, you can talk about judgment in a way that's not preachy and insufferable. And you will often go over the line. But the alternative to talking about morality is to have no one talking about morality. And we are moral creatures and we all want to be better people. And you raise successive generations who don't have a moral vocabulary, who don't talk about grace and sin and redemption, uh, and who don't have a formula or even a theory of moral formation. And so somebody has to talk about it, even though the reputational risks are A, that you won't live up to your standards, which is inevitable, or B, you'll seem preachy and self-righteous, or D, people will think you're talking about sex. <laughs> uh, and, and so I talk about it freely, uh, running the risk of being insufferable to some people. Yeah. I was trying to explain to someone the other day why I like the concept of sin in public. And the way I summed up why I'd love us to be able to talk about sin again is that in excising it from our culture, we've let ended up with this bizarre, seemingly contradictory mishmash of no one is responsible for anything because we're just stimulus and response mechanisms determined by our genes or our background or whatever it is. But then everyone is responsible for everything because there is no such thing as forgiveness and redemption or change. And so I, I can't even describe it, but it's the two things at the same time, hugely judgmental and hugely permissive, seems to me to be psychologically much worse than yes, I am sinful and I have somewhere to go with that. I have the possibility of change. I have help. You know, there's, there, there is forgiveness is on the table rather than um, a total thing. Do you recognize that? And what might help us move beyond it? Yeah, I, I would say if, if people are raised as we all were, at least I was, it, with the social science mentality that schooled in the phrases of, of social psychology, uh, of of um, sociology of economics, in which, as you say, the human person, the agent is not there because it's all correlation and what correlates to what and what determines what. And it's good. And these fields are great at generalizing about populations. They're not particularly great at looking at the individual human person. And so you school people in this and then suddenly people have to make judgments about the individual moral person. They swing radically over and suddenly it's the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, and so there's no like a middle ground where you see people as modeled selves, M-O-T-T-L-E-D. Uh, and, and frankly, there are no formula. I mean, the religions have spent, and the other moral systems have spent a lot of time thinking about forgiveness. Like, how do you do it? You don't just say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I forgive you. Yeah, it's just too simple and too easy. So there are rituals of confessing the sin, correcting the sins, reparation for the sin acknowledging the sin, acknowledging the sin exists, but it will not be a barrier in our relationship to one another. And so these formula are not only, I think, baked into the, the fabric of the universe, they're just super useful. <laughs> and so as Americans, we try to think about racism. There's a formula here that has been established over centuries and maybe in all time. And if we ignore the formula, then we're just casting them out in darkness. And most problems have been thought of through three or 4,000 years of, of theological and, and spiritual formation and thinking and, and teaching. And to leave that all behind, which frankly, a lot of American Protestants do, like it's like Jesus came, yada, yada, yada. I had a personal relationship with Jesus, all that social teaching. Nah, I don't really care. Uh, that's, that's one advantage the Catholics have and the Jews have that's steeped in tradition, really good at transmitting the inherited knowledge of the ages, which when you have a populist religion, especially American evangelism, uh, which is a direct encounter with God, uh, you're not gonna have the depth of knowledge that comes with centuries of refinement and thought. And the American church is suffering that crisis right now. And their attachment, in my view, to Donald Trump, and their unwillingness of large parts of evangelism, evangelical community to face up to racial injustice, uh, the siege mentality that justifies a means justifies the ends mentality. 
I mean, I, I entered this faith like it was like investing in the stock market in 1929. Like I came in at the worst time, like just when the American church was going through a crisis that's, and young people, for understandable reasons, were leaving in troves. Um, uh, thankfully, I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> I'm going to finish with a final question, which circles back really to the beginning about how how do we get better at crossing these tribes, at connecting on a human level. You've been a liberal and then a conservative. You've crossed tribes of faith and politics and written deeply about how we encounter each other. And at the end of the second mountain, there's this kind of relationalist manifesto. I know there's a lot more coming in what feels like part three of a trilogy. I'm hoping it's what your next book will be. But if there's one thing that listeners could do, actively change their behavior, not just think about, that might help them be part of the solution, not the problem, to these deep divisions and differences, what would it be? Well, to be practical, the, the next book I'm writing about is on the skill of seeing others and being deeply seen. And so it's how do you really get to know another person? And you think you can be empathetic and emotionally place yourself in another person. You probably can. <laughs> you, you know, you just, empathy is useful, but not just that powerful. So the, the single trait that correlates with the ability to know other people is verbal intelligence. You have to ask them. You have to have a conversation, which we've just been having. And so getting really good at conversation uh, is uh, is part of the skill of getting to know other people. And there are tra- things you can do that will make you better at conversation. Uh, be a loud listener like, uh-huh, okay. I have a friend who's a loud listener. It feels great to talk to that guy because he's always affirming. Uh, restate what the person just said so you're sure you understand it. Don't fear the pause. That uh, when we speak, we like a imagine my arm is a is a an answer. I start talking to the shoulder and I talk to the end of my fingertips. But somewhere around the elbow, we probably stop listening so we can think of well, here's what I'm going to say next. But if you're having an important conversation and you're saying, okay, I'm going to listen to your whole statement, I'm going to pause for six seconds, then I will respond. That can be very powerful. Uh, keep the gem statement in the center. If you are um, Uh, If you're disagreeing about something, there's something that you agree on underneath. So if me and my brother are disagreeing about the health care our father should get, we may violently disagree about that, but we both care about the health of our father. And so if you keep that gem statement at the center, uh, you'll have something. And then finally, the, the quality of conversation is determined by the quality of the questions. And so my my favorite questions, and you've asked me deep and penetrating questions, uh, You know, my favorite questions are are questions that elevate you so you look at your life from a higher altitude. So there are questions like, um, what crossroads are you at? We're not always aware what crossroads we're at. Or uh, what would you do if you weren't afraid? You were not always aware of how fear plays a role in our lives. Uh, I read one from a guy named Peter Block. um, What forgiveness are you withholding? What what, What commitment have you made that you no longer really believe in? And so these questions are really open up excavations. They don't yield easy answers, but they begin explorations. Yeah. And so I think that's the practical skill of overcoming a lot of uh, our social and moral woes of actually taking the time to try to get to know each other through podcasts. Everybody should be on podcasts all the time. (laughs) And on that very helpful infomercial, David Brooks, thank you so much for talking to me on The Sacred. Total pleasure. Thank you. Well, honestly, I was more nervous about this episode than most. And partly that's just because David has been writing for a long time. So he's just written absolutely loads and feeling probably prepped for it was quite a significant task. Actually, I think it's partly because I'm formed into finding older, impressive men with opinions intimidating frankly. Um, But it's also because it feels like there was such a lot to talk about, but I was very quickly put at my ease. And it was so lovely to hear about David's journey and his reflections on the wrestle of the personal and the private and the public. And this kind of thing he's worrying away at about how can we become more like the people that we want to be and the challenges of that. I really loved his description of himself as a kind of schmucky, self-confident teenager. I was really moved, actually, by the description he had of um, Sacred Valley. He was talking about time and continuity. And I think he used the phrase 
these places where we know that people have been violently alive for a really long time. And I think we all kind of recognise that sense of being part of the continuity of human life. And it's quite awe-inspiring thinking so many millions of people who have felt as deeply as us and lived as fully as us over the centuries. It's a sort of chronological equivalent of expanding our consciousness away from just us as our individual selves to a sense of those around us, that staple of kind of all ethical and wisdom traditions is a deeper consideration of the other. And I was reminded that that can work kind of backwards in time and perhaps forward in time to future generations as well. Uh, it was funny hearing him talk about, you know, when you when you come to Christianity from his particular background, you come to kind of Jesus of Oxford colleges, you come through often a very bookish intellectual route. And then the tension with the Jesus of that world, with Jesus, the uh, Middle Eastern revolutionary and the many, many worlds actually that this figure can hold. I find it really refreshing when particularly men model vulnerability in public. It feels like something that is both more acceptable in and also more required of women in public. Um, so I really, I really value it. Um, people who let their guard down a bit and say, look, we're all just trying our best here. Um, I loved him talking about morality and the difficulties of talking about morality and encounter and the ecstatic and these moments of intimacy and connection with other people. And it reminded me again of something I referenced a not a lot, which is Ian McGilchrist's work on the different brain hemispheres and the way we've kind of created a society where left brain thinking that's a more linear and um, concrete and measurable predominates over, and this is a massive simplification of his work, so apologies, but the, the kind of right brain which orientates to intuition and faith and creativity and these less measurable, less concrete things. Um, large ways of society just haven't had any training or formation in those things, haven't developed. What would it mean for a society where these intangibles that are so deep and so important and yet so hard to measure or talk about, where we could increase our levels of comfort with them or maybe patience for them? Those are some of my thoughts. I would love to hear your reflections. Send me a tweet at, uh, at esoldfield at sacred underscore podcast. Send us an email and uh, just be in touch. I really love having conversations with listeners about what they're thinking about. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Sacred. Remember, sharing is caring, as my four-year-old says. So please do send this or another episode to a friend. Rate us on Apple Podcasts or my personal favourite, leave us a review. I really get a thrill when I see a new one pop up. Huge thanks to Abby Allison for research and production support and Emily Down for our visual identity. We are edited by Drew Hawley and our music is composed and arranged by Luke Stanley with vocals by Lizzie Harvey. The Sacred is a project of the Think Tank Theos, and you can find out more about our work at theosthinktank.co.uk.